All right, so we left off kind of talking about elasticities. Um, before we kind of get to tone in the things, um, good. I guess I should show you, be able to see kind of that next homework. So due dates was kind of two weeks from um, when I posted it. So like I said, we should be able to start chipping away at that based off what we covered in class. I still have eight of you, so I'll try to, to, to speak this. I, I've got the announcements up there. I should walk you through it, but I still have eight of you that you need to register your remote, your iClicker remote under your iClicker account. I've got a couple of you who reached out. who are going to stay after, and I'll kind of help you get that registered, but I can still see eight of you in there. I see your names. You're registered for the course, but I also see kind of your remotes that are not syncing up. So if you're still seeing zeros kind of pop up there in Canvas, please kind of try to get on there. Get on your iClear account, register it, or stay after, and I can kind of help you with that. Okay. All right. So, any questions for me before we kind of jump back into material here for today? So, um, we talked about some of the I think we ended on kind of looking at some different uh, goods, you know, some different products, and you kind of see there's a pretty wide range. So we mentioned last class, I alluded to this a little bit, that elasticity is not quite the same as slope. And that in fact, at different points on the demand curve, even if the slope is linear, right? The slope is always the same. We can end up having different elasticities at different points on that demand curve, okay? So um, the slope will be the same, uh, but elasticity is gonna vary, okay? So a good rule of thumb is that as you kind of move down this demand curve, or as quantities get higher, we kind of think about it here, the, the more or the further down the demand curve we get, right, the higher the elasticity measure we're going to see. So we can kind of think about here, we're going to have more elastic demand. And here we're going to have more inelastic demand. And kind of the reason why is because if you think about here, what was our elasticity measure? It was the percentage change in quantity demanded in response to some percentage change in price. Right? Well, when price is low, even small movements in price is going to be, um, or sorry. Move up here. Actually, we have this backwards, right? So, let me label these the other way. When prices are low, really small changes in the price will be large percentage changes. So, when we're at low prices down here on my demand curve, we're going to get really, really large values for our denominator, right? These percentage changes in price will be really large. So, the idea of if I go from $1 to $2, $2, that's like a 100% increase in price. Whereas if I go from $1,000 to $1,001, that's a very small percentage change, right? So these low price amounts, we're going to get some really large percentage changes. Well, when we know the price is low, that quantity demanded tends to be higher. So when I have quantity demanded be higher, or these relatively large values, well, now, even if I, you know, decrease by 10, if quantity demand is 100, that's a pretty small percentage change in price. So when I'm low on the demand curve or over on the right side of the demand curve, I'm going to have really large percent changes in price, really low percent changes in quantity demanded. I'm going to have very small numbers divided by a very large number, or I'm going to end up with something that is less than one, right? And so being less than one, we know we're on this inelastic portion of the demand curve. And then the exact opposite is true when the price is high and quantity is low. Well, then changes in price, even large changes in price might be very small percent changes. So I then have a small value divided by, well, when quantity demand is low, once again, going from one to two units, that's a very large percent change in quantity demanded. So when I'm up here at the top part of my demand curve, there, we're going to be seeing really large percent changes in quantity demanded, really small percent changes in, in price. So, you know, 100 divided by 10 or something like that. 
we're going to end up with elasticity is greater than one, which is what we said is elastic. Right? So as I move kind of down this demand curve, demand becomes more and more inelastic. Right? Questions on that? And at some point, what was the other thing that we talked about? There will be some point where, right, we've got our elasticity being equal to one or what we called our unit elastic point. So this will become important for something that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Okay. So I can kind of imagine if I had some demand curve here, <laughs> the slope is always the same, right? It's a linear demand curve. You know, I can see rise over run here. So what? So it's from 30 to zero. So that's change from kind of y divided by the change in x. Goes from zero to 60. That's so negative 30 over 60 or negative one half. I don't know if I have that value here. But that's not the same as my elasticity. So I can actually calculate my elasticity. We went through the method last class, so I'm not going to write it out today because I'm more concerned with a different principle. But remember, we could take the new and old quantity demanded, we take the new and old price, we could change, divide it by the average, that gives us our percentage change. Right? If we do that, it works out to be that uh, quantity demanded went up by 200%, and then the change in price is only 40%. So here, we have an elasticity of five, we would say it's very elastic, right? We saw a 40% change in price and people over responded, right? They responded by 200%. Now, if I looked at a different point in this demand curve, right? I have two different quantity demanded, two different prices, 10 and zero. Plug those into that midpoint method equation, right? Where I'm just taking the change divided by the average of those two values. That would give me the percentage change in price and percentage change in quantity demanded here. I'll come back to this one. That here, we all saw quantity demand only went up by 40%, even though the price decreased by 200. So here we would say people were very unresponsive or very inelastic. Also kind of, you can see that by, when we actually divide those percent changes, we get an elasticity yeah. less than one. And then in that middle part of the demand curve, I use the price of 20 to 10 and the quantity of 20 to 40. There I get my percentage changes are exactly the same. Right. So in the middle of my demand curve, that's where we're going to see this unit elasticity occur. Down here on the right side, inelastic. Up here on the left, or at the top, elastic. Okay. Jeez. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not that excited, I guess. Uh, so why is this important? So we want to understand the relationship. I said last class, why do companies care? Why will companies care about the price elasticity of demand? Well, because when I change my price, if people aren't going to be very responsive to that, I like that, right? Because now I'm not going to sell that many fewer units, but every unit I'm selling, I'm making way more money, right? So companies would really like for people to be inelastic, right? That if I'm changing the price, they're not going to change how much they're buying by very much. So what's the relationship between elasticity and revenue? Okay. So if our elasticity is changing along the demand curve, what's going to happen to total revenue? Well, I haven't really gotten this yet, but we can define total revenue. I'll just call that TR. So, total revenue here. If I'm selling something and I'm just concerned with revenue, how could I figure out how much revenue I made? I sold, I don't know, 10 units, and each unit cost $20. How much revenue do I make? Close multiply. Yeah, I just pay the price that I'm selling every unit for and multiply that by the number of units I'm selling. So total revenue will simply be the price that we can charge for that good times the quantity that I'm selling. So we can start to think about how does this relate to the Well, I want to choose the price quantity combination that maximizes my total revenue, at least for right now. So we won't, won't can be concerned with cost yet, but we're just trying to maximize revenues. I want to choose the price and the resulting quantity that kind of results in the highest possible revenue. So we've got our total revenue is price times quantity sold. 
I'll kind of walk through some numbers and then maybe I'll do a little bit of math and kind of a little more math and, and minded. Uh, the way that is, right? So let's think about a very simple example where I've got my quantity demand is five minus one. Right? A really nice, easy kind of linear demand curve. And I'm thinking about my elasticities here. So sort of put that equation up there as well. So if I'm moving, and I'll kind of maybe want to do the visual here. My demand curve starts at five. So kind of a, maybe almost a review. What um, quantity? Sorry, and I'll rewrite the demand curve here. So this would be uh, um, this is how I've shown it at this point. So I should have had this on the slide. So think about this as the demand curve, right? I'm just solving for it in terms of my y value. So what price would result in the quantity things? Um, sorry, what quantity would result if the price was zero? Well, if I plug a zero in for the price, zero equals five minus coin demanded, move the coin demanded over to the other side. I would get that that number of units at that price of zero would be five as well. So this is just a nice, really easy example, right? Price starts at five, people will buy nothing. As I lower the price, right, once I get down to that price of zero, people will purchase five units. So if I'm moving from this price of five, this price of four dollars, right? I'm decreasing the price. So let's first think: what's that impact going to be on total revenue? If I decrease the price, right, that's going to lower revenue. But I know that when I decrease price, people are going to buy more. So if I was charging a price of five and selling zero units, what's my total revenue? Well, five times zero is zero. If I then lower the price, I'm now selling one unit for $4. Well, now my total revenue is four. So up here, when I was moving from five to four, right, total revenue is increasing. I'm going from zero to four dollars. So I'm actually going to do a couple things here at once. But I'm actually going to, at all these different quantities, I'm going to graph out total revenue. Okay. So here, what's total revenue when I'm got the price at five dollars? Zero, zero units are sold. Zero total revenues. When I lower the price to four dollars, I now sell one unit. One unit times how much I'm selling it for is four dollars. Total revenue is four. Now we're kind of keeping this unit by unit in practical or practical sense. We're talking about like thousands. So we're going to have like maybe one representing thousands. So we can kind of think about there would be a number of units in between zero and one, right? Or one like zero to a thousand. I then lower the price of another dollar, right? So now that I'm charging three dollars, <laughs> this consumer buys two units. Okay. So I've lowered the price three dollars. I have two units here. I'm trying to get this. Line up. So at two units, what's my total revenue? Well, selling two units for three dollars, price times quantity gives me total revenue. All right, my total revenue is six dollars. And then go to my third unit. Well, at that third, sorry, if I lower the price to two dollars, I'll sell that third unit. But what's my total revenue when the same thing, right? So I'm actually kind of ending up with flat line here. And then if I go to four units, you can kind of see without the rest of this, I've got a total revenue of $4. And then when I go five units, right? Well, the price is zero there, so I'm not making any money. So you can kind of see this relationship that as I lower the price, right? There's going to be a certain movement in my total total revenue curve, but what did we say is true about this portion of the demand curve? This is where we kind of saw this elastic portion of my demand curve down here. This is going to be my inelastic, and then here was kind of where we saw that unit. So notice when we got unit elasticity, our total revenue was kind of maximized. Right, it's flattened out there at that portion where it was unit elastic, and we can actually compute using this demand curve what the elasticities were. So there, we were just looking at that relationship between total revenue and changing the price. 
But why did that relationship exist? Well, here if I've got um, very small percent changes in price, very large percent change in coin demanded, when I divide my percent change in coin demanded by my percent change in price, I get a really large value. Right? Now, they're always going to be negative, so we're just thinking about we want to look at the absolute value, right? That's where they're greater than one, at the absolute value of my US. So we've got really elastic demand. What that means is people are really, really responsive. Okay. So if people are really responsive initially, right, at this top part of the demand curve. That means that even when I see really small percentage change in the price, so maybe like this isn't a perfect way to think about it. Well, actually, I'll use the values I use up there. So what negative 22? You can kind of think about it as when I decrease the price from five to four dollars, I decrease total revenue by 22 percent. So that's not perfect mathematical way to describe it, but thank you. It's a good way to think about it. So I cut the price right by 22%. That's going to cut my total revenue by 20%. But because people were really responsive, the amount they purchased, the 200, went up by 200%. So yeah, I'm making less money, 22% less money on every unit I sell, but I've increased the number of units I'm selling by 200%. So that percentage change in the number of units I'm selling or the quantity more than compensates for the amount of money I was losing by lowering that price. Right? So that's why initially lowering the price is leading to higher total revenues. Right? Because even though lowering the price is not good for making money right, in terms of you know, total revenue, when I lower the price, the response of people, right, that they bought a ton more. That was really good for making money, or that did increase full revenue by a lot. And then you can kind of keep going down. Okay, demand is a little bit more, or sorry, demand is a little bit less elastic, right? We're going from negative nine to negative 2.3 here. So initially, when elasticity was high, I increased total revenue by $4. Now it's a little bit lower. If I increase my price here, I know people are still being very you know, responsive. Just not as much as they initially were. So now when I lower the price again, well, they're still elastic, so it still shouldn't increase total revenues, but it doesn't increase it by as much, right? Now the increase in my total revenue is only going up by two dollars. So higher elasticities, if I'm lowering the price there, will result in much higher total revenue. Then I get to that unit elastic point, and I notice if I'm at that unit elastic point, if I'm changing the price there, well, what's happening to total revenue? Well, this is like um, I'm decreasing the price by 40%, and that increases the number of units I sell by 40 Exactly, they can't each other out, which is why at that unit elastic point, we have total revenue kind of flatline or being at its maximum. But, yeah. So how can price go from five to zero and be negative twenty? So we can already be a negative twenty. Where so these percent changes in prices are between each dollar amount. So it's going from one to zero. So the reason why it's not hundred is because remember we said it depends on what direction I move. Okay. Right? So we we're using the midpoint method, right, to calculate the U.S. Is that right? yeah? Any other questions? And then if I want to keep going, if people are very inelastic, well, now if I'm moving price even lower, going from two to one dollars, I can calculate my elasticities. Here I see the percent change in price, right? How much that's going to lower total revenue, much more than the additional number of units I sell. So demand is inelastic. And when I lower the price there, well, now total revenues are falling. Right? Because that percentage change in price, 67, is not more than compensated for by the increased number of units I'm selling because people have now become less elastic, right? They're now being elastic on that portion. Right. So try to get a little bit of visual, kind of throw some numbers up there. Um, you know why? Or why? These are here. It's really the same kind of thing. So maybe this helps to kind of. Think about from nine point five to zero, right? We're going from kind of these one dollar increments, and you can calculate us to see that penny increments. If you really wanted to, um, just kind of a nice simple example here, going by a dollar. So I already mentioned the unit elastic point. Um, 
So we know that revenues are related to elasticities. And I usually like to draw something like this because it kind of helps you see like uh, when we had elastic demand, by lowering the price, total revenue was going up. Right? When we we're on the inelastic portion of demand, well, here, if we continue to lower the price, total revenue is actually decreasing. And then at the unit elastic portion, if we're moving the price somewhere in that range, we would kind of say that total revenue has been maximized. Right? It's kind of flat, but it's as high as we can get. All right, so let's say this a little bit different. I'll write another graph over here when you talk about maybe what this means. So, so I've got a lot going on over there. I've got some different numbers. Let's do a different color over there. So let's say here's my quantities, here's my prices, and I've got my demand curve. Okay? And then I want to graph out here at these different quantities what would total revenue be? Go here. You can kind of always think about if I were to look at, I didn't draw this very symmetrical because it doesn't necessarily always have to be like, it only worked out to be symmetrical there because I had like a slope of negative one, right? So it'd be a little bit different if it weren't. You won't have to necessarily know that. <laughs> um, what you do need to know is where will total revenue be maximized? We said here at that unit elastic portion of the demand curve. Now, when I was only doing dollar increments, I kind of had that range, right? In reality, I can make penny increments. So I'm going to have like one very specific point on my demand curve that is unit elastic, right? So I would like to do what? You kind of think about this as, I would like to set my price that would put me exactly on that unit elastic point of my demand curve. Because if I can set the price there, total revenue is maximized. Okay. Now, if I ever end up making a pricing decision and I'm on the elastic portion of the demand curve, so let's say I'm at you know, some price up here or I'm at the elastic portion, what do I want to do to the price? So let's say I was right here, right? Whatever this pricing would be, my minimal cost is. What would I want to do in order to increase my revenues? Well, I'd like to get to this sweet spot, but how do I do that? Yeah, so if I'm on the elastic portion, I want to lower prices. Because even though I'm lowering the price, I know people are going to respond by buying a lot more, right? They're really responsive to price changes. Well, notice if I'm lowering the price, that's increasing the units. We kind of think about it as, I'm moving up that total revenue curve. Okay. And then the exact opposite is going to be true. What if I'm at a price, I don't know, we'll call it 10 here. If I'm on the inelastic portion, what do I want to do to my price to increase total revenue? Yeah, I want to move back to that point. At increasing the price there is going to decrease the number of units, but it's going to move me up my total revenue curve. Okay. So we have very different behaviors. Like if I'm a company and I figure out I'm on a portion of, like, given my current pricing decision, I'm on the elastic portion of the demand curve, I need to make sure that I increase the price. But if my current, um, my current price is on the inelastic portion of the demand curve, well, then I need to increase the price to increase my total revenues. I think the visual kind of helps with that. Huh? Um, I kind of already talked about this. Where did I put mine? So if we increase the price, right? We're getting a higher price per unit, but we're selling less, right? So it really depends on what portion of this demand curve we're on. So I think I've got another way of thinking about this that you already get it. Maybe this will be boring, but this is another way of kind of looking at it or thinking about it, right? So let's say I did we start out, um, I'm on that elastic portion of my demand curve. Well, when I was selling, so let's say I, I had the price at four dollars and I'm decreasing it to three. Okay. Well, when I was selling it for four, you kind of think about it as my total revenue was one. So that 
first unit, I was making four dollars. Right? If I then lower the price to three, well, yeah, I'm losing out on a dollar because I'm no longer selling this first unit for four dollars, I'm selling it for three. So my total revenue went down by a dollar. But by lowering the price to three dollars, I'm now selling an additional unit. So how much did I gain from selling this second unit? Well, the price is three dollars, so I gained three. So that gain of three is more than compensated for that loss of one dollar. Okay. You can kind of also think about it if I was on that unit last at Portman, so I'm going from three to two dollars. Well, by lowering the price, I lost a dollar on each of these units I was selling before. But I'm now selling a third, I'm only selling for two dollars, so that unit last at point. The losses from price are exactly compensated for by the gains in the additional units sold for the additional quantity. And then in elastic portion, going from two to one dollars, well, I'll lose a dollar on each of those units I was selling before, but I'll sell one more unit, but I'm only going to make an additional dollar. Now I'm on the inelastic portion. If I lowered my price, right? I'm lowering my price, I'm just increasing my total revenues, right? This is another way of thinking about it, kind of visually seeing it. So we've got it broken down by units and dollars and kind of some nice easy numbers here. Um, so it's basically a trade-off, right? When I'm lowering the price, I know that I'm going to lose out on total revenue. But if the trade-off or the gain is greater from the number of additional units I sell, well, that's going to increase my total revenue. The only time that's the case is when I'm on this elastic portion of the main curve. I'm on the elastic portion, then by increasing, or sorry, I'm on the elastic portion, then by decreasing price, I'm increasing my total revenue. So I left this slide. I've drawn this now twice, but I, I, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit. Um, but I just want to make sure I, I, I kind of reminded myself that I'm going to stack these up. I, I think I did it. It's probably better that I introduced it earlier. So this slide probably should have been a couple slides over, but, but this is, is kind of what we have on the board. Make sure that you kind of got these stacked. I think is a good way to think about this. Okay. And not even just stack. I think this is like, I'm really sloppy sometimes. Draw like nice arrows <laughs> that kind of help you like kind of see like, oh yeah, I want to be pushing full revenue towards that, that point. And if I remember that at the maximum part of full revenue, that's where I'm unit elastic, and that's the price that maximizes total revenue. Well, now if I think about if I'm on the elastic inlet, I'm just pushing towards this maximum price. All right, so let's see how well we're we're following along here. Oops. So let's say we had an example like this. Let's say Marlboro cigarettes are currently cost four dollars, and they're thinking about raising their price. Right? So they're thinking about increasing their price. Their current estimate of where their price elasticity demand is at is negative point four. Okay? If they raise the price right from four to five dollars, and they're on the inelastic portion of their demand curve. Right, because the elasticity here is less than an absolute value, less than one, it's negative 0.4. What would happen to total revenue? So I'll give you a couple seconds to think about this. Talk to the people around you, right? But if they're thinking about increasing the price, right, from four to five dollars, the current elasticity is negative 0.4. What would happen to revenue? the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 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 
All right. If you haven't gotten an answer in, take your best guess. I'm going to talk about it here. So 32 of us here today, 34. Everybody got something in there? All right. I'm going to close it out. Missing a few people today. It's a Friday afternoon. So maybe a couple ways of thinking about this. First, I'll kind of use the graph because that's what we've been doing. But then I'm going to kind of give you an intuitive explanation. You know, with words that you about it. So if my elasticity is negative 0.4, what portion of the demand curve am I on? I kind of already said it, but inelastic, right? So let's just think I'm somewhere here, okay? Polar revenue is right there. If I then, in, and I guess here, I said, what if I increase the price from four to five dollars? Right? So if I increase the price, that means I'm gonna sell fewer units. But even though I'm selling fewer units, I'm making more on each unit. And if I'm on the inelastic portion, that should be moving me towards this maximizing price. Sorry, this total revenue maximizing price, I should say. Okay. So I'm on that inelastic portion. Increasing the price there should increase my total revenues. Okay. If I can get this to. Okay. All right, we'll do one more. Hopefully this one should be easier after I kind of walk through this and I'll give you explanations here. Another way of thinking about it in just a second. So let's say instead I was on that unit elastic portion of the main curve and I was thinking about raising my price. Well, ignore the, the red here now because that applies to the last one. So I guess I should get rid of this. Maybe help you out. If I'm on the unit elastic portion of my demand curve, right, it's negative one price elasticity, and I then change the price, I increase the price from four to five dollars, what's going to happen to total revenue? So give you a little bit of time to think about this. But if I'm on the unit elastic portion and I change the price, now had a maximum price there. What might be a little bit easier to think about with this problem is when I've got kind of this portion up here, right? There are going to be two prices. Even though I drew it at one point, technically it would be like two cents, right? I'm going to have to calculate these percentage changes between two quantity demands and two prices. So there will be this small range, even if it's infinitesimal, where I've got unit elastic demand and I can still change the price and kind of remain on that unit elastic portion. I gave you here a single price just to make it easier to think about. But in reality, there will be two specific prices where in between those, that is where the unit unit elastic. So this one we're kind of talking through together. So hopefully everybody gets this one correct. It's a good way for me to see if people are paying attention to that. So if I'm on the unit elastic portion that increased price, what's going to happen to total revenue? Total revenue will increase, 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 decrease. I'm on I'm on the unit elastic portion. Like I said, here I had it as dollars in practice, probably cents. Right? It might be like 2.50 and 2.51. But there has to be two prices where that portion of the demand curve, even though I threw it at one point, it's like a infinitesimal small range. It will be unit elastic. I can move between those two prices. And what should happen in total revenue? Doesn't change at all. Still open. And so hopefully everybody gets this one correct. So make sure you get an answer in there. She had 36 people. Everybody make sure you got an answer. I thought I had 36. Maybe it was 34 before. All right, missing one of you. We're good. All right, I'm going to close it out. Okay. So that one is a little bit tricky because when I gave you this visual, it was really just a, a, an easier way to think about the directional changes. You're trying to move for this unit elastic price. But in reality, that unit last price, we calculate elasticity as movements between two prices. So it would be like a, a set. You know, there would be, a, I guess, two prices that technically are unit elastic. Okay. And then I think I've got another one, but I'm not going to ask you. Oh, I guess I didn't have another one. I could do the exact opposite, right? If I was on the elastic portion, what should I do to price to maximize revenue? Yeah, I need to lower my price. But increase my quantity, move up towards this, this maximum point. Okay. Um, where are we at in time? 
So we got quite a bit of time. I do I want to do this? Nah, yeah. I'll wait. I'll hold up until next week. So we've been talking about elasticities. Um, I'm going to kind of relate this to some other stuff we talked about as well. So cross price elasticities are no longer looking at the price elasticity of demand, but we're now thinking about how does one good respond when the price of another good changes? Okay. So I think I outlined this a little bit for one minute. But I said, if you think about the elasticity of demand, is whatever's in your denominator, that's what's changing. And then whatever's in your numerator, that's what's responding, right? So it was the price that was changing elasticity of demand or how is demand responding to that price. So if I want to cross price elasticity, and I'm thinking about how does, I call this X and Y, yeah. So I'll write this as my elasticity for two goods, X and Y. In practice, people be like peanut butter, jelly, you know, whatever, whatever two goods you want to use. Here we're going to be thinking about the percentage change in the coin demanded of good X, right? So how is this good that I'm interested in X? How is it responding to the change in the price of another good? So I can think about here, I think I flipped these, it doesn't really matter. X and you know, however, I want to use my subscripts and see what I the coin demanded of good X. How does that respond to the change in the price of some other good? Water? So we've kind of already alluded or talked about this before, right? So this was like if the price of um, batteries goes up, right? What's going to happen to the coin demanded? Sorry, or you think about this as what's going to happen to the demand curve for anything that uses batteries? Price of batteries goes up, the demand for anything that uses batteries goes down, right? It's not like the price, I, I need both of them to use, you know, at the same time, so it's almost like you just increase the price. Right? So anytime I see an increase in the price of a good, and as a response, that decreases the quantity demanded of some other good, so an increase in the price of batteries, you think about as many electric batteries for cars, decreases the demand for electric cars, my cross price elasticity, I've got a what? Positive and negative, negative divided by a positive, a negative, so that would be less than zero. Well, what was that an example of? What types of goods? When I'm using them at the same time, you said those were complementary goods. The other types of goods we had would be substitutes. What do you think is probably true about the cross price elasticity for substitutes? Well, if it's things that I use in replace of each other, we can think about this as the easiest way I think to think about substitute goods are just different brands, right? So let's say I go into the store and I see the price of two liter of Pepsi is like five dollars. What do you, you know? Or sorry, let's say we start out the price of a two liter of Pepsi and Coke are both two dollars. Pepsi then increases their price up to five. What do you think happens to the coin demanded for Coke? Jumps way up, right? People are going to substitute away from Pepsi to buy Coke products. Well, by some increase in the price of Pepsi, and that increased the point demanded for Coke, we would say the cross price elasticity between those two goods, positive over positive, right? And positive, what are their substitute? So the sign of our cross price elasticity should tell us whether or not these goods are complements or substitutes. So we don't have to, you know, when I was giving you examples, right, you know, the age old one is peanut butter and jelly, just because there are a lot of people who just eat that on sandwich, but preferences of people change. But guess what? The companies don't care about you as a person. They care about overall, what are these goods used as, right? So even though 10% of the population might not use peanut butter and jelly as complements, if 90% of the population does, that's what the company cares about, right? So you would calculate these cross price elasticities across everyone and then kind of make your, you know, company can make decisions kind of based off of that. So that's how we actually identify goods as substitutes or complements is we look at some actual pricing data. So when we see the changes in the price of some good Y, we then calculate that percent change in price, same way as what we were doing before the midpoint. 
you would have two prices. So I would just do, you know, kind of, I don't even think I have this in the slide, but it's a good way to think about it. So we'll call, uh, here's my two prices. I then divide that by the average. This would give me my percentage change in the price of the block. This is like, this would be like if the price of Pepsi 2 liter went up two to five dollars. I could actually compute what that percent change in price was. After that change, I would then look at what was the decline demanding of Coke. I would do this the same way that I was before. I would take, it's just now I have to use X's and Y's to denote that I'm looking at the pricing and quantity of different goods. But I would just take, okay, when that price of that good Y changed, how did the quantity of X change? But then to compute the percentage change, I said I had to divide that by the average of those two quantities, right? So we're still going to be computing these percentage changes the exact same way. It's just now it's the change in price of the Y and the percent change in the quantity demanded of the X. Questions on this? So it shouldn't really look any different. I kind of mentioned the other ones. Um, well, actually, before I show this, maybe some already saw it. So if you, you saw it, don't guess when I ask the questions. <laughs> but I, I just like to, like I said, I like you know, talking through these to think about what these U.S. are. So we had the price of that the demand, which was how did the demand for X change when the price of X? Cross price of that city, how did the demand for the X change when the price of another good change? So if I'm thinking about income elasticity, right? How do I write this? I think I have it as I. Income elasticity. Well, I'm still thinking about how does the percentage change from coin demanded, or how does demand respond to? Well, let's see, income elasticity. What am I probably thinking about to my denominator now? The percentage change in. Yeah. Income, right? It's the income elasticity of demand, right? Cross price elasticity of demand, right? So we're always thinking about how is demand responding to the change in these other things, right? So um, income elasticity of demand, we're going to end up with kind of that percentage change in quantity demand in my numerator, the percentage change in income in the denominator. Now, this will look a little bit different, right? So when I compute this, I guess I could kind of call this like, I1 and I2, but it's really going to be the same procedure, just we're putting an I there because it's no longer the change in the price, it's changes in income. So I would look at what was that change in income divided by the average income. So add those two up, divide by two, that would give me my percentage change in income. Okay. We compute the denominator just the same way we have that, or sorry, we compute the numerator the exact same way we have been, it's just now in that denominator we got income. So if income goes up, right, the percentage change in income is positive, and the quantity demanded of a good also goes up, we would say positive times a positive, so we've got a positive elasticity, income elasticity. Those are normal goods. When people have more money, they buy more. If, when the income goes up, people buy less, we said that was an example of an inferior good, well, when that's the case, I'll have a negative over a positive. My elasticity will be negative. So when I see negative elastic income elasticity, I've got inferior good. When I see positive income elasticities, we call that kind of normal good. This one's a lot easier to measure in practice. Um, well, you could break this down by region, state, county, city. But generally, if I'm looking at um, average income in the U.S., all I have to do is look at two time periods where I've seen average income change and then look and see, well, how much did the amount of this good change over that time period as well? And that'll tell me whether or not it's a normal or poor inferior good, right? I can calculate those, you know, income changes just kind of like for the entire country, right? Because that's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in any one person's, you know, maybe for some people, you know, ramen noodles are a normal good and other people are inferior, right? I'm just concerned with overall. When I see an overall income change in the economy, how does the coin demand of that good respond? Okay. 
I don't think that's too bad. Um, we get one more five minutes here. So, if I've got my elasticity of demand, is how did demand respond in the uh, price changes? If I want my elasticity of supply, what do you think that's going to be? How does the quantity supply change to a changing price? So a whole lot different, right? Now we're just looking at the coin supply as opposed to the coin. What's going to be true now makes our life a little bit easier. So before I was talking about like absolute values for like putting into these elasticity ranges. What's going to be true about my elasticity for supply? If I see a positive change in price, what should happen to the you know change in coin supply? If I increase the price, producers are going to want to supply more. Yeah, more. So I should always have a positive elasticity of supply. So putting it in these ranges makes it a little bit easier, right? And I've got the same sort of ranges. If it's greater than one, we say it's elastic. Less than one, we say supply is inelastic and unit elastic point being equal to one. Now, we don't have as interesting of a relationship at least in this class that we'll analyze. Like with demand, we had, how does that kind of relate to total revenue? We won't necessarily have that with supply. Um, we could do some interesting things, but we won't do it in, in this class. So just talking about a couple of the other elasticities. Um, you know, we'll go through this pretty quick. We're not going to handle this too much. Um, but think about the elasticity of supply. When do you think supply is more elastic? When producers have, let's say producers have a very long period of time, um, change their production decision. Okay. So if we're looking at like a, a longer period of time, they have more time to change their production decisions, they can be more responsive to price change. In the short run, right, like over the next day, how responsive can I be to price? Well, I can't change my entire production process in 24 hours, right? So we generally think about more time, companies will be able to be more elastic and the less time they have to make decisions, the less, less elastic. Or as we kind of move forward, what we'll generally call more time, we'll call this like the long run, right? Over a long period of years, less time, we'll call it short run. This is decisions that we can change in hours, days, all right? The less time we have, the less elastic we can be as a company. We can't change as many things. The more time we have, right? The longer time period we're looking at, well, I can, you know, I can build a new production plant in the next 10 years. Can't build a new plant, right? So I can't really adjust my production decision overnight. So that's why we would say we'd be less elastic and we have less time. So this should lead us into the next thing. Um, if you get to these questions on the homework, this is where you can stop. Um, it'll be talking about things like surplus, right? So consumer producer surplus, dead weight loss. If you see any questions like that in the homework, that stuff we'll be covering next week. Okay. All right. Have a fun, safe weekend. I will see you guys on Monday.